have faith in yourself that you can make it work that if you keep trying if you if you keep going at it it is that constant failure eventually leads to success so walking away from stuff letting it go wrong accepting that it didn't work out is fine as long as you keep going at it because you will find the thing that works eventually So Christine Armstrong is the founder of Armstrong and Partners, which does great research into the future of work and the workplace. We're going to be having a lot of laughs on today's show. Christine has a really great sense of humor, and we're also going to be talking about some deep topics. The main overarching theme is mental health in the workplace. We're going to try and get tactical, whether it's you've got young kids at home or you're hybrid working or you're working remotely and you're feeling really lonely or you're like a manager and your staff aren't coming in the office and you're trying to connect with them. Christine's going to give some really good tips around that and stress management and glimmers and micro stresses. So lots of new concepts I was introduced to, which I think you're going to enjoy. All right, Christine. So in your own words, you said at one point you had the worst job in the universe. I imagine it's not that great to talk about that period of your life, but what are you comfortable sharing when it comes to that worst job in the universe? Okay, I think uh, it was a bit of a throwaway line. I think in in light of all the jobs in the universe, it categorically <laughs> was not the worst job in the universe, but it was possibly, uh, it, w- it was definitely on the spectrum of the worst kind of design job for me personally. So I had a job that I loved. I worked at an ad agency And I was um, sort of working a team, running research projects where we gathered up research from all over the world into really interesting things like what 20 somethings were into or what people thought of the green agenda. And we wrote reports and we presented them all over the world with video, we had data. I mean, it was just like the the dream job for me because I love information. I love research. I love innovation. And I love presenting. Presenting. So it was kind of all the things and I love travel and meeting people. So it was like this really externally focused job and the reports would appear, you know, newspapers all over the world, you know, front page of the FT, front page of, you know, the, the biggest newspapers in Germany or France or Italy, whatever. So it was really exciting. And then um, I had a baby. And my boss at the time, who's really supportive, still, you know, still in touch with him now, he was headhunted for another job while I was on maternity leave. So I came back. And, um, it, you know, I won't go through all the details, but essentially my job was not it was not available anymore, apparently. Uh, not Certainly not in the way that I'd left it. And so I kind of went, right. So I decided to find another job. My husband had um, taken voluntary redundancy after 18 years in the same uh, role, uh, a bit of time before to set up his own business. So he was in the process of setting up a business which didn't make any money. So one of us really did need to have some sort of an income. So I, I kind of looked at a couple of jobs uh baby was about five my first daughter was about five six months old and um I took one in a big agency and it was a research agency and I know why I did it I had two big thoughts and one was I love research but I've never worked in a research agency so I want to get better technical skills that was one of the reasons I wanted to do it and the other was that I wasn't client facing at the ad agency so I present to clients but I didn't run clients day to day so I was effectively a cost uh, rather than somebody who was bringing money in so I thought I want to be client facing and I want to be more technical so I took this job and I had doubts before I even arrived but at the end of the first morning I knew I'd made a terrible mistake and um, I went to a park near the office and I called three people. I called uh, my husband, who I think pretty much said, you, you just don't know enough yet, like stay with it. I called my old boss who said, get a grip, go back to work, sort yourself out, you'll be fine. And I called a coach that I'd worked with before and she said, get your handbag and go home. And so two out of three, I kind of steeled myself and went back to the office, but it was pretty terrible and I ended up staying I think for about two years but I did have another baby just in order to be able to escape legitimately for a while. I wanted to ask you something around intuition because Mm. it's interesting because you said even before you took the job and on the first day you had like Mm -hmm. intuition right that something wasn't right. Mm -hmm looking at it maybe from without the intuition side of things as you said like with your husband your old boss oh, it's your first day what are you talking about right you need to you need to go back to work 
I think sometimes, especially in the modern day where there's so much data around everything, everything's got to be like data driven, which is in that case, oh, you've only been there one day. That doesn't make sense, right? So what's your view when it, and especially looking back now on what happened, when like using more intuition when we make decisions, not just in business, but, but in life? I think my I, my intuition was correct. And I don't think if you'd have told me on that day that my intuition was correct, that I would have been surprised. I think I knew. I called the person, that sort of recruiter who put me into the job two days before and said, I think this isn't right for me. And she said, no, you are perfect for this job. This is the perfect organization for you. And I remember thinking, you're not right. So I don't think it was my intuition that was off. I think it was the confidence to call it and the confidence to say, I can get another job. I can leave this park, get my handbag, go home and get another job. And this will be fine. That was the piece that was missing for me in that moment, that belief and all of that advice around how you have to stay in jobs for a while and, you know, don't burn any networks and it's easy to get a job when you've got a job. All of that stuff was what held me back. So I think, yes, believing in your intuition is really important. But the harder thing sometimes is following it through. So I know um, a lot of your current content you post, by the way, Christine makes amazing videos. I want to ask you after the conversation, actually, Christine's for some video video editing tips. Uh, but Christine puts these great videos uh, on LinkedIn and there's topics around like, you know, hybrid working versus working in the office, you know, being a, a mother in the in the workplace. Um, you Obviously, you said this was like a terrible experience, this particular job. What was it? That made this job bad and like what have you learned from that you know in the, in the current work and also this great content you're putting out it was a toxic environment so organizationally the design was wrong in that they had two leaders who hated each other it was designed to make a lot of money out of very genius staff over a very short time spirit. So from the from the moment I got there, it was all about doubling revenue in order for the senior people to get bigger bonuses. I mean, it, all the motivations, all the purpose was off. Um, the environment wasn't very nice and the tone of communications was terrible. Uh, so my husband went from asking me at the end of the day how my day was to how many people cried today. Um, it had a very heavy long hours work culture. Um, which was based around recent graduates working very late into the evening, eating pizzas or Nando's and getting taxis home at 11 o'clock, having worked potentially a 16 hour day and then coming back in the next day and doing it all again, which led to, as you would expect, poor decision making, high levels of stress, high levels of burnout. And so it was just a very unpleasant place to be. In addition, it wasn't the right job for me because having told me in an interview, they wanted to do a lot of the kind of research I'm interested in, which is talking to people. Uh, really, it was a survey shop and they really just wanted to push surveys and heavy, heavy data projects, which isn't really my natural joy spot. You said something they're making money from very junior staff. And I'm thinking about, I've, I've had a bad experience in a company like that and I've worked, I've had clients that kind of have that business model. I've never heard it expressed in that way before, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not a good business model to have. No. Yeah, I think when you've hollowed out all of the middle management, when it's just the bosses, and then what we would affectionately, maybe it sounds patronizing, but I think it was probably affectionate, the kids, which was, you know, a lot of them had, you know, graduated in the last year or two. So they're kind of, you know, in London for the first time, they're enjoying life. They're not, they've not got any money to spend really. So a free Nando's mm. or a free pizza, it's not to be sniffed at. They're, you know, they're happy with all of that. But the amount of pressure and the unrealistic deadlines and the unrealistic client expectations, which have been set by above, were they were taking responsibility for things that they didn't have enough control over. Imagine in this period, you were, well, I think you just said you were feeling a lot of stress. Um, and you know, I've seen great content now around, you know, uh, how can we manage stress? And I think even the most Zen person, and as a lot of Zen people we've had on this podcast, like monks, we, we all face stress at certain periods of our life, especially in the workplace. Um, guess kind of two questions here one how did you deal with stress at that particular time in your life and like how has the way you deal with stress evolved uh, over the years 
so I think at that time I dealt with it incredibly badly and I veered between just wanting to run away and telling myself that I could fix it and part of the story that I was telling myself was I've always been good at my jobs I've always liked my jobs I've always really enjoyed work works my safe happy space and if I work hard enough I can make this better and I don't think that was true and I don't think it was a helpful thought I think sometimes you can make things better but if you've got a new baby and are not sleeping and are still trying to breastfeed it and get home at a sensible time and you've got two bosses who are clearly toxic from the very first meeting that you go into you can't fix that and so I think one of the things that I've learned since that period is there are environments that you can't thrive in and there are things you can't fix if you don't have enough power to fix them and if that's the case then it's time to go and do something else and for some reason I didn't get that for quite a long time into it it was quite a long time before so literally I got pregnant deliberately in order to escape I mean I did want another baby but it would have been sensible to wait a bit longer because I could have got maternity pay but I just didn't care at that point so um, I got pregnant and had my second baby took time off um, unpaid but didn't care and went back which is the really extraordinary thing after that second maternity leave and it was so awful when I went back it was so terrible it was worse somehow and um the one thing that I think had kept me going is I had one particular client that I worked on. I got on really well with the client because she had kids the same age and she and I talked about a lot of stuff. And I came back because like, oh, you know, how's my client? And I was told they weren't in, told by one of the people in charge that there weren't enough seats in the meeting room for me to go to the meeting. Uh, so it was like it's like the one thing that I kind of sort of had valued, I guess, about the experience was under threat. And I, I did get into the meeting and it was sort of a result, but it, it changed things. And eventually I went out for lunch with an old friend who's a therapist and an artist and very wise. And I'd sort of blah, 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 <laughs> for about 45 minutes and she she did she said exactly what you know that part conversation she was like go back get your coat and go home this is done and I said I can't you know I've got a full-time childcare Chris's business still isn't making money like you know we've got a mortgage she said you'll figure it all out just just go there's nothing good here and I literally went back and resigned yeah it's amazing how you do manage to figure things out as well when things you really seem down in the dump so it's i think that's been a constant theme on this podcast when people have thought there's like no hope but things do always sort themselves out it takes time though and that's what i would say so i think i work, walked out in the october or november and i didn't start working consistently again until the following september october so it was a really really tough year in our household and i don't ever want to gloss over that because in retrospect, I could have made a much more considered set of decisions. So, for instance, when I went back after that second maternity leave, there was nothing to stop me asking for a three day week or a four day week or to finish at three uh, or, you know, I don't know, to, you know, to change, to take the edge off it in other ways or to move to another division. It was a very big company within that. There were lots of things that I could have done before it got so bad I pulled the plug. So, in retrospect, what I think. Margaret Heffernan, who's a fantastic author, has a great line when she's coaching people. She told me, she says, um, what would you have done if you'd have done everything? And that's the question that I needed. I think when I when I realised, what would you do if, if you did everything? Well, you'd ask for different hours. You would ask to move. You would ask to, you know, maybe change role. You, you, there were lots of things I could have done rather than just walk out into the cold British winter and, and battle on. Fast forwarding to today, I think you said since then, you've had like a great career um and obviously you're, you're thriving at the moment what has been the difference because um, i think there's actually a lot of people that listen to the show it's it's uh not necessarily a business podcast but a lot of business people listen to this so there may be heads of sales heads of marketing ceos you know heads of different departments and obviously they will want to create a good environment for their staff right so they're not that boss you had before and it's uh bosses you've had after and obviously now your own boss what's how do you create a good environment um for your staff right how how do you not be that person that, that, that you know wasn't a good boss to you I think I'd start somewhere slightly different which is 
where you kind of started with it, which is what have I learned? And I think what I've learned about myself that has made, made that meant that every other job since I've been significantly happier is I've learned that the environment in which you thrive knowing what that looks like is essential and lots of people don't I think when I see lawyers who are very unhappy they don't like the legal environment that they're in it's not that they're not good at law or they're not interested in law it's like for whatever reason the situation that they're in it doesn't work for them whereas somebody else in that exact same environment might absolutely be thriving love the competition love the edge love the hard work you know and, and so I think the environment finding environments in which you can thrive is a big piece of it and the second thing is the very specifics of what you do that give you energy and joy, what are those? Because what I probably instinctively knew but couldn't verbalise at that time is I'm a very external person. I'm very interested in new ideas and new places and new people. And so a job that kept me sort of trapped in a basement looking at, you know, tracker numbers for a big technology company was never going to motivate me it was never going to energize me let alone with all the other stuff going on and so really thinking about the qualities of the environment that you're in the things that you do day to day that give you energy and joy and we all do stuff that doesn't give us energy and joy but you know making sure you're tilted towards that I think it is really important I think for your question about bosses I think it's when you're hiring people when you're bringing people to making sure that those two things match what they're looking for even if they can't express that in as coherently as you can in retrospect it's interesting what you said around like thriving because as you said that you gave the good example of like uh, a lawyer maybe two lawyers are doing the exact same job um but one of them is hating it and one of them is loving it i'm even thinking of my friends so uh i know actually lawyers have moved into sales and they're much happier doing that and I know lawyers that are in law and they're, they're really happy doing that, right? Um, so I guess sometimes, because I'm just thinking around a lot of my friends, I feel like especially in London, there's a lot of people that don't enjoy their work and sometimes they want to move and they're not sure where to move to, what job to do. And I think it's quite a good way of looking at it where you're talking around like, what environment do you thrive in? But how do you go about that process? How do you know what's the environment that you would thrive in? So I would go back through all the environments you've ever been in or worked in. You know, do you love nightclubs? Do you love restaurants? Do you love being at home in libraries? Do you love, did you love school? Did you hate school? Did you love college if you went to college? Do you, you know, do you love being in a busy sales environment with lots of people on phones? Or do you really love, you know, just working at home when nobody disturbs you? I'd really kind of literally list them out. Where, where's the happiest? Where's the most productive place where I get my energy? You know, I'm married to a massive introvert who's an engineer by training. He would not leave the front door. Uh, we certainly he'd go to the end of the garden, perhaps, but he wouldn't leave where we live from one week to the next perfectly happily and just be so happy to be in a little bubble. Whereas I, you know, I've got, I have to get out at least every day and I need to go away. You know, it's great. My, the job that I do is fantastic because I get to travel and then I come back and I'm very pleased to be home. So you have to know those things about yourself. And I think you can look at your own history to establish them. I think the, the tricky thing which really fascinates me is that I did drama as a kid and wasn't great at it. I was all right at it. I did a few competitions and things, but, you know, not nothing amazing. And then I presented through that research period at the ad agency. And I started off and I was really bad at it. You know, I, I, I can make myself like try and chew my own fists by how bad some of my previous presentations have been. And yet somehow I found in the last, I don't know, 10 years that probably the place where I am at my best is quite often on a stage and taking that finding that stuff out does take a bit of time and almost when I left you know after that job I basically co-created a, a consultancy and did lots of work really enjoyed it there are lots of good things about it um, but it's only since I've left there that I've made a full-time focus had a full-time focus on performance whether it's with videos uh, that you talked about or um, speaking at events uh, and running events or emceeing and so that's been quite a late life discovery very interesting so it was you did drama and then you realized you kind of it was still performing but it was like performing on videos performing on uh like giving I speeches 
did drama and wasn't that brilliant at it, I suppose I would say. I sort of did it as a sort of activity and thought, I'm not great at this. There were people who were so much better than I was and sort of gave it up and then didn't really pursue it as a thought, but kind of my job just led me to do talks and and then did them badly, then got better really quickly. And then once I got to a place where actually I was like, I, I can read a room pretty well. And, and, you know, I see a lot of amazing speakers in my job, which is one of the great joys of it. But I know pretty solid you know I, I sort of pretty analytic about my own performance and um I, I can do it it's not going to always happen but you know I can do a good talk and really hold a room and I probably couldn't have said that to you 10 years ago what's what have you learned in terms of public speaking because I know again it's just something a lot of people get have fear of public speaking it's actually come up on on other podcasts so versus like 10 years ago to, to Christy now and you sound quite confident in going and giving those speeches like what's changed what have you learned hmm. so I think one of the things about public speaking is that if you want to get better at it I'm pretty sure you can um because I did and there's nothing really that's and the reason people don't like public speaking is there's nothing more painful than doing a public speech or a public event that goes wrong because it's a really terrible feeling and you get very immediate feedback kind of the reason that actors sometimes prefer the stage to the screen you know in the room whether you've got people's attention or not and I consider it a personal failing if somebody's on their phone when I'm speaking I mean I, you know, I consider that like an insult essentially um I don't mean that in a really serious way but I just think well I'm not doing very I'm not doing a good enough job like I take that on I'm like that person isn't focused so like what you know how how do I engage the room what do I need to do so that community that constant interaction between the audience and the person on stage for me a lot of what I now understand more analytically is about energy how do you how do you capture the energy of the room how do you bring people together and I've learned a lot of tools that have really helped me something that Meg Pepin who's an amazing coach said to me uh, is that a meeting hasn't started until everyone's spoken so even if I'm speaking on a stage with 300 people or 400 people, um, I'll try and find a way for people to speak before I start. Sometimes I'll say, you know, we'll say hello to each of the person next to you. So you've got someone to talk to at lunch. Sometimes I'll get everyone to stand up and I'll run around the room with a microphone and ask them for their thought. And so I might not ask everybody if I can't, but if it's a small number, I'll ask everyone to speak. Um, I'll ask a lot of questions as I go, which can be really cliched and annoying if you do it badly. Uh, but if you do it in an engaging way, it can really work. So there's lots of things you do. But really, I think it's being very aware of the energy of the audience and where you sit. And as when we did the introductions, you asked me about a particular event that you, you couldn't go to, but you were hoping to go to a sales event. And one of the things I did in preparation to speak at that event, I'm not a salesperson is to interview a lot of people and so one of the ways to really gauge people's attention is to you know you stand up and say listen I've been talking to you and this is what you told me is really on your mind and if that's correct people are really then very interested in what you're going to tell them yeah yeah we had a bit of a cosmic moment when uh Christine and I were talking before the show because I realized she's speaking at the sales enablement conference which I wasn't <laughs> wasn't expecting it's not in her background so then Chris, Christine ended up interviewing me and asking me for tips I was like I thought I was going to do the interview you were fantastically <laughs> useful I used what you said on the stage you were great <laughs> awesome uh I, I I was actually thinking about something um and I don't know do you ever give like virtual talks or vir virtual event speeches yeah, I yeah I do. so I I've been thinking about this recently. I don't, you may have some like data or stories around this. I feel like since the pandemic, because this whole like, you know, Zoom teams, whatever you're using to, to do your event, it's been happening a long time. I think anyway, it's obviously much harder to keep an audience engaged when it's a virtual speech, right? And we do sales training, which often, you know, it can be a training sometimes with 100, 200 people and we're trying to make it interactive. So in a way, it's kind of a, a speech. And the in-person stuff is just easier than the, the virtual stuff. But with the virtual stuff, I feel like people are almost becoming more and more annoyed with it sometimes. As you said, it depends on the personality, like your partner who's an introvert versus yourself who's more extrovert. Maybe you'll get a little bit more annoyed. But with virtual events, and this I'm probably asking a lot for myself here, how can you keep people engaged? And what are the differences like speaking at a virtual event that you need to bear in mind versus like an in-person one? So I think it's going to be really focused and really short. I was talking to a learning and development specialist at a music company recently, and she said, you know what, we try and we focus on micro learning. So everything needs to be six minutes or less, uh, ideally three. 
So if I was doing a presentation that's all online, it's kind of chunking it up into small blocks, getting people to do stuff. If it's a training event, I'd have them answer a quiz, you know, keep mixing it up. So uh, when we make videos, we talk about pattern breaks, what surprises them, hearing a different voice, seeing something completely different on the screen, asking them to engage, asking for a word in the chat. You're constantly trying to look for it to be an interaction, a flow of energy, not just you pouring your energy down the screen and hoping that they're not currently making a cup of tea, because I guarantee not only they're making a cup of tea, they're also on their email and their WhatsApp, um, and yeah. possibly shopping at the same time. So, <laughs> you know, you've got, you're fighting against a huge amount of things that they could be doing. The Microsoft data indicates that people are multitasking when they're on a video Teams Zoom 42% of the time, but that is only based yeah. on other Microsoft products. That doesn't include their WhatsApp. It doesn't include anything that they're doing in the room. So it's a massive yeah. underestimation of how much you're competing with people's attention. So you have to work really, really hard at your content, making it super engaging and interesting and useful that's a what was that 42 percent of 42%. people are, and they're just really? going through other windows and that's without external things outside that's of just laptop, in microsoft yeah. on microsoft products yeah it's just yeah. what they can see that doesn't that doesn't surprise me at all um the number's gonna be so much higher if you could actually yeah let's let's um come on to i know uh you, you did a video, video this week around um hybrid working um and i was actually thinking of uh well, it's it's simple. It's, I thought of this story because you were talking about your drama background. I actually tried to hire someone recently, and they're based in New York, um, and their background is actually drama, and they're a, they're a brilliant salesperson. They did some part time work for us. I made an offer, and they said, "Look, if you had an office in New York, like I'm not going to move to London." I would sign straight away. She was like, "I'm sick of working remotely," because um, the the head for the HQ of the company she works for is in San Francisco, and they've got an office in. Ireland as well and she was like I just can't deal with remote working I just want to be in the office and she was you know more of that like extrovert personality like you but I know one of the things you were talking around around like hybrid work maybe is not like the best solution because it seems to be like the most common thing that especially like tech companies are doing at the moment I was wondering if you could talk through your your kind of opinions and data and stuff on this so the demand for hybrid work is huge. It's what most people say that they want, but there are people who'd rather be in the office full time. Um, from our research, the, there's one group that wants to be in the office, uh, more likely to want to be in the office full time. Do, do you know who they are? Yeah. Uh, interaction, get on here. Uh, people who live on their own. So I don't know if the person- Oh, she right, lives okay. On the person, so she, own, um, she lives with her partner. She lives with her husband, okay. but yeah, it's just the two of them. Yeah. No kids. So people who live on their own are more likely to want to go back more days from our research. I haven't seen that in, in big data, but that's what our research tells us. Um, so uh, so that's one thing. So people do, but people generally want some sort of flexibility. What we talk about is the difference between fluid hybrid, where you choose which days you go into the office, and fixed hybrid, where it's agreed which days you go in. And generally people say that they want fluid hybrid, but they then find it quite difficult. There's a lot of cognitive overload, choosing which days to be in, um, making sure you're in for the right number of days, your boss is there, seeing your friends, clients, colleagues, who's looking after the dog, who's looking after the car, who's dropping the kids off. There's a lot of thinking and in the households, it can lead to a lot of tension between partners if they're both working that way. Weirdly, although people don't want it, they tend to find it easier to work in a fixed hybrid where if you just know that you're in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you just build your life around that, your train tickets, everything else is just sort of ordered. So I think hybrid probably is a really good way to work for most people because pre-COVID, the problem we had was that people just couldn't fit their life around their work. It was just taking up so many hours and so much time online for so many people that they just couldn't do anything else. This allows people to do other things in their life, whether they're training for a triathlon or, you know, putting kids to bed or whatever it is, it gives them space for those things. But a lot of organisations, as the blog was saying today, just haven't done the work to change their processes to make them work in hybrid. So they're still working as if everyone was in the office, but actually you have to think a bit more about management, think more about engagement, plan meetings and calls much better. Um, and, you know, think about, you know, how people work in different ways. So it does require some work and a lot of organizations just haven't done it yet. Interesting. Yeah, it's like, we're gonna do hybrid, but not really think it's, it's less simple than, than people realize, right? And I like what you said around the have the set days, because that's the thing of, oh, I'll go and, and I've been that person before. I was actually working hybrid even before the pandemic. And I would like choose the day that I wanted to go in. And my old bosses didn't like that. And at the time I thought, oh, it's a bit backward, but actually maybe 
for them, it's easier for them to manage it. I never put myself in their shoes. That is that managers find hybrid very difficult on the whole because they feel like not only am I managing all the things that I was managing before, but now I don't know where anyone is or when they're coming in. <laughs> you know, they were talking to somebody who was running a call center. She's like, we don't even know if people are sick because, you know, previously they didn't turn up, but then you knew that they weren't well. Now it could be 10 o'clock before you realize that somebody's emailed somebody else and they're not actually working yeah. today. So it just all takes a bit more thought and planning, which is, you know, none of us like to do, but actually it's the only way to make it work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because there's even things, I mean, again, you know, obviously when you run your own business, you start to have more sympathy sometimes for your, your old employers. Your but previous bosses. Yeah. yeah, things like, you know, someone working remotely and just saying, I oh, check in on Slack when you started working. And in your head, you're thinking, oh, it's like they're monitoring me to check that I'm working. But it's also like, maybe they don't want to disturb me before I'm actually working. So it's just to check down there. And then when they do, then they'll send me a message, right? So sometimes it's it's coming from a good place of intention versus a bad place of intention. It's a really good example how if you say that, I, you know, I love, you know, that I, my, my practice is to check that you're on Slack so that I don't disturb your morning before I communicate with you. Who go, oh, that's a really nice thought. If you don't say it, they may feel watched. And, uh, yeah. you know, I often cite a case of a partner at one of the big management consultancy is being absolutely furious. She wanted somebody in her team to be on a call at four o'clock. And he said, look, you know, I'm picking up my kids. And she was like, going mad. You know, he should be in the office. I can't believe I'm having to negotiate this as a client call. And you can't speak to the other person, but they've never had a conversation. And my guess, having interviewed a lot of people is that he might say something like, Do you know what, I'm online from seven in the morning till 10 at night. And you know, yeah. my kids having trouble at school. And the one thing I want to do in the day, I don't take lunch, is just to pop over and pick them up at the gate and check they're okay. And that's all, that's it. That's my only requirement. But because they haven't had a conversation, neither side understands that. And he probably feels really frustrated that it's unreasonable. She feels it's unreasonable and you kind of got this tension. So it just requires us to be a lot more um, expressive, you know, communicate better. We can't just see things in the way that we did, you know, in an office, somebody comes in looking a bit, you know, green around the gills and they're not feeling well or they've had a bad night or, you know, they've had a big fight with their partner and it all comes out. It doesn't necessarily come out on Teams or Zoom. Yeah, and I think whether whether you're listening to this and you've got um, a damaged relationship with your boss or a person you employ uh, in your team, have that conversation. Like you said, often a lot of it is just sorted out by having the conversation. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask uh, around, you know, um, if you had any data with regards to this subject for like different demographics because i feel like there's a lot of and i'm probably guilty of this as well so saying like sales i think as an example there's like a negative stereotype that you know younger generations are like a bit more they hide behind email and linkedin because they grew up with social media but i've actually met some like incredible and trained like 22 year olds that just want a cold call right um so i was wondering when it comes to like hybrid working um working remotely Another thing that I found actually sometimes training younger salespeople, they often want to be in the office, right? Because they, like I think of myself in early on in my career, early 20s, I wanted to be in the office more to like from a social aspect, right? Of like going for after work drinks and being around someone that was really smart and like just hearing of hearing them and having conversations with them. So if there's any data around like different demographics and what's their view with like hybrid working, working remotely, et cetera. So you sort of have a U-shaped curve. You've got older, more traditional groups, slightly more inclined to go into the office more often or say they will, they don't necessarily turn up. You've got a group with young children who are more likely to tend towards being at home more. And then you've got younger audience more likely to want to go to the office a bit more. But these are degrees. There isn't one demographic group that says they want to be back in five days. And if you interview 20 somethings, they're like, no way. Partly because they would never get their jobs done because they get so bombarded already with so many beeping pieces of technology that they can't focus. If you add into that, people going, oh, hi, who are you? My name is. Could you have coffee? Could you do this? Could you do this? They just say, I just couldn't get anything done. So maybe they go to three days, whereas, you know, some groups are one and a half. And, you know, it's kind of of that ilk on average. There aren't there aren't big groups that are desperate to go back five days a week. So, um. So it varies, but people generally want some sort of flexibility of location. They they also want some flexibility on hours, but it's not as 
pr pronounced as, as as pronounced you know people broadly want to work a working day and if they've got a reasonable reason the dentist the doctor whatever they expect that to be tolerated as it was pre-covid um but they don't necessarily there aren't people who want to start at seven and finish at three that isn't an on mass request there might be people who just sort of work to that pattern and might agree with their boss fine but that isn't something we're hearing calls for in the way that we want people do want to work from home I think the biggest thing people are struggling with is those boundaries that we talk about all the time. So pre-COVID, people felt they had too much emails. Now they feel they have too many emails, too much Slack, too many Teams messages, too many WhatsApp messages from work. And it's all going on. And there's no way of, of sort of holding back the tide of that. And I think that's really what people want from bosses. In terms of your point about using the telephone, it's a really interesting one. I do hear it a lot everywhere I go. 20-somethings don't like to use the phone. Um, to which, you know, I, I think, yeah, there probably is some reticence. I think if it's, um, I was just thinking about um, Dr. Eliza Burke, which does brilliant data on the generations. I definitely encourage you to follow her. Um, and it's something I think she talks about. But a, a something I read about teenagers is, you know, previously when, you you know, your parent made a phone call, they would be stood in the hallway of your house and they might say, oh, hello, Dr. Surgery, I'd like to make an appointment for my son or my daughter. And you would hear all of that interaction. The way we use phones now, a lot of it happens in private. So kids don't necessarily grow up hearing the same kind of phone calls that they would do in previous generations. And so maybe part of that is about um, showing people how to do it and the training that you're doing. Uh, I know, you know, doing this call centre work, um, before I did the sales enablement, you know, managers saying, well, you know, getting people just to listen in on other people's calls builds their confidence in terms of how that kind of a call goes, because they, they don't necessarily know much about it, because all the calls they've been done, they've been doing, as you said, have been text based or GIF based or, you know, through other social media, Snapchat and so on. They're just not used to making phone calls in the way that we were. 100%. Yeah, no, you're, you're speaking on it. You're, you're, you're sounding like a sales trainer here, uh, Christine. <laughs> that's, what, right. that's what every sales trainer wants is the call recording, which again, sometimes salespeople is like, oh, they're monitoring us and the clients are going to think they're being monitored. But actually, it's it's not just your manager can listen to a call, but it's if you're really good, then someone yeah. new joins the company and they can listen to that call as well. And there's a lot of that naturally, like when you're first in a company, you don't know what you're doing. So like listening to the best people is, is massively going to help yeah. you. And if you're in an office, that would happen naturally. I mean, the same as how you learn to run meetings. You know, you sit through meetings for 10 years, which somebody else runs until yeah. you pick up all of the skills. Um, yeah, so it's really, I think it goes back to that. We have to work a bit harder to bring people yeah. up to speed. If they're just sat at home doing calls on their own, they're not going to get much better necessarily. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I feel like this is going to be a bit of a work therapy session for me here. I'm, uh, okay, abusing the, the trust in the podcast. But yeah. the uh, I... I we've started a bit of a hybrid model going in like one or two days a week. I've got a colleague who's in London. I've got a colleague in uh, the North of England who comes down, but then I've got a couple of colleagues that live in like Latin America and the U S we're, we're kind of all over the place. So I'd say we're predominantly uh, remote really. And in, and I have worked fully remote and I do think there's times where I've got very bored of, of working remotely. And then the, the girl I was talking about earlier. So I've got some tactics that I use around like having a commute in the morning where I like walk, you know 15 minutes and then come back or meditation or exercise or whatever it is there's some things that have have kept me sane um and as you said i think most people are doing the whole hybrid thing now but for those that kind of have to work remotely because they're in a different location geography than than everyone else like what's your advice for them when it comes to their own like well, uh, mental health so you have to track your own energy you know what gives you energy and what detracts so if you get energy from spinning classes then i'd say right start your day with a spinning class you know book one in at 7 30 go and spin and then get on with your day or book one in at lunchtime you know i get because of the as you mentioned i'm an extra i get a lot of energy out of calls so i know when my energy dips in the day so after lunch so i book a call like this for you around lunchtime i won't do it at nine eight nine ten eleven in the morning except when i can do really focused deep work and i don't need to have external stimulus but at three in the afternoon it's a great time for me to do a call because when you'll be dipping off and then it'll be lifted uh by engaging with someone so i think you have to track your own energy flow during the day and know your own cycle I think then you have to think about what gives you energy and what takes it away from you. So things that give you energy, exactly as you said, going for a lovely walk, going for a swim, hanging out with a pet, chat with your colleagues, stopping having proper lunch in the garden. It's beautiful. All those sorts of things you know, give you a lovely boost of 
endorphins you feel really great you can get on with the day and things that might detract from it you know drinking too much the night before uh not going out in daylight not varying your task sitting for too long I mean, we sleeping really badly because you were up watching you know the latest series on netflix and till two in the morning we know all of this but we're really shit at doing it for ourselves so uh dr bill mitchell who's a wonderful uh clinical psychologist has written a book called time to breathe it's really analytical about being almost mapping out what gives you energy what lifts you up and what detracts from it we can put a link to his episode on the blog uh, in the notes if you want yeah please if you send that that'd be great and um yeah a lot a lot i think a, a constant theme i'm hearing which i like because again cosmic bridge a lot of this is around like balance and in life is do what works for you and i I'm thinking, I wouldn't call myself super extrovert, but I've done those Myers-Briggs tests and I'm more, more on the extroversion side and actually may change my day now because I'm a morning person. So actually, I think I would probably do better writing in the morning uh, and then actually have some calls in the in the afternoon, like uh, like you were talking about. With um, uh, something I wanted to come on to, I, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but I think I, I saw, and this goes on to like everyone's situation is different. You, you did quite a funny video around like all these like motivation influencers like get up at four in the morning and swim and, and do this, but they're obviously like not people with like young families and, and just like, you know, don't have such a normal life. Um, and it kind of got me thinking around what you're talking around, like every situation is different. It was you that did that video, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It yeah, was, uh, it was. It was a while. Back. I think. I mean, it is really what works for you. I mean, one of the things you know, some people really love being with small children, as an example. You know, and they really get energy out of it. Brilliant. I never did. I've got three kids. I do not get energy out of hanging out with toddlers. <laughs> And and sometimes you just have to be honest about who you are and say, yeah, I'm going to spend some time. And then, yeah, I'm going to put you lot to bed and I'm going to go to yoga. I, I need to go and chill out and do my own thing. Or once you're in bed, that's it. I'm turning on Netflix and chilling out. Or I'm going to go and see my friends and have a really, really good laugh about what a pain in the ass you are half of the time. And it doesn't mean that we don't love you, obviously, but it does mean that children are draining and exhausting and we don't need to idealise it like a flipping Instagram post. So I think just being brutally honest with yourself um, about things that give you joy and lift you. And um, I did a little uh, blog the other week about glimmers. Uh, which is Dr. Nicole LaPerla, LaPerla, I think she's called on Twitter. And she talked about how, you know, we talk about stressors all the time, the things that give us stress, micro stresses, Rob Cross writes a lot about. Uh, but we don't talk so much about glimmers, you know, those moments where you just feel at peace with the world, where the sun's shining, you've got a cup of coffee, you're in the garden, all is well, you know look we can choose to have glimmers we can choose to put them into a day you know I go for a run in the morning quite often uh before the kids are properly up and I can come into the house and launch into washing up and clearing up and school shoes and ties or I can just sit for a couple of minutes in the garden and just be and I can choose that moment to like feel the endorphins look at the day take a minute to myself and then get on with it and, and knowing that that's a choice is really important and I think that's what I lost in that terrible job for me was that the things that I could control. I I, I, di I didn't control the things that I could control. I like that term, glimmers. So identifying what are the things that, you know, give you endorphins from a scientific perspective, but those, those moments in your day that you like and creating more of those. And when you have a word for it, you notice them more. So when you you just kind of go, you, you know, I sort of I took one of my kids out for a milkshake the other week. We were just sat in this beautiful cafe. She had a milkshake, had a cup of coffee. The sun was shining. It's just like, it's a real glimmer. You know, she's calm. I'm calm. It's beautiful. Everybody's happy. Like having a word for it allows you to revisit it really easily. Yeah, love that. On the the other side of the spectrum, uh, something I hadn't heard before, micro stresses. What are micro, micro stresses? stresses? So, so Rob Cross is an American academic and he wrote a book with his business partner. And I've forgotten her name. I'm so sorry. We'll put it in the notes. And I haven't got it in front of me. Um, which is about micro stresses. And oh, hang on, I found it. Sorry. This is not good podcast content, is it? So uh, Karen, so Rob Cross and Karen Dillon. And what they noticed was that a lot of stress we feel at work isn't the big things that I was talking about, like being completely in the wrong environment with toxic. Uh, senior management team it's about loads of small things that stress us out which is like your boss having a really annoying way of asking questions or you know somebody who's always late to deliver that bit of information that you need to do your report and all these little things it's somebody not giving you enough information to do something or enough budget whatever and what they said is that they, they kind of identified this 10 percent who are really able to manage that stress really well and kind of rise above it and they were looking what does that 10 percent have and really interesting answers so one of the, the, the people who uh don't 
who don't foot kick the stress back. So if you send me a stressy email saying, Christy, you're late for the podcast, I could send a really stressy email back going, well, you didn't tell me exactly when it's supposed to start. Or, uh, you know, we and, and then the football of stress is going backwards and forwards. And what they say very often, it comes back, the more stress you send out, the more likely it is to come back and hit you in the face. So instead, go, if you kill that stress and go, be right there with you you've killed it, it's gone. You don't get anything coming back. So really working out how to stop that. Thinking about your processes. If every week somebody sends you something late, don't just get annoyed every week, call them. Can we have coffee? Can we just talk about how we improve this process? What? Can, how can I help you? What can we do? And the other thing is, is what they call dimensionality, which is if you've got a, a varied life with friends and activities and things you do, you've got much better perspective on your stress and you're much less likely to absorb it and to manage it better. And one of the things I see, I do loads of workshops with people, the people who are most stressed are very often the people who just have their household and their job and there's not much else, you know, so you could encourage people, you know, go and play golf or go dancing or play bridge, doesn't matter what it is, just, you know, go and do things that uh, take you out of this headspace. Two, two very interesting points. So the last one you just said around often the people that are most stressed are ones that um, they're just, they kind of have the household activities and family and then work and that's it. Is that right? Mm, yeah. So is yeah. there like data studies around that? Well, it's their analysis, but I also did a bit of work with a resilience coach and he had this uh, tracking system. So he would track people's stress over the week through monitors. And he said that the highest stress point in people's week was on average was Saturday morning. So this idea that uh, Saturday, you know, the weekends are our least stressful time isn't actually accurate. So wow. I think what I took from that is that often household activities are just as stressful as work. So if you wake up on a Saturday morning like I do and go, go one kid to drama, one kid to one football match, another kid to another football match, and then I've got to organise lunch, and then I've got my parents coming. You know, there's that's just as much to think about as a working day, right? But if I go to yoga or bridge club or book club or go wild swimming with my friends, I'm not thinking about any of those things. But you have to deliberately choose to find the space and the time to do all of those things. Well, that's fascinating. Yes, it totally makes sense. Just never, you'd never would have thought it until you explained it like that. Saturday morning is the time that can be a higher stress. Yeah, because you've got all your, all your other responsibilities, which you've... Shopping, um, cooking, washing, everything you've yeah. saved up from the week is yeah, now so in a say, pile, um, the list on yeah. a whiteboard. <laughs> and then the other thing I think is really obvious, but I don't think we're cognizant of it, which you said was around like, the more stress you give back to a situation, the stress is going to come back, right? I really like yeah. that. Um, yeah. yeah, very powerful. So if you're that person sending out stressful messages to your team, go, this needs to be delivered by five o'clock. If it's not delivered, there's going to be da 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 All of that stress is definitely going to come back at you. And you're the one that's going to be there at 10 past five, tearing your hair out because it didn't. So really think about how you impose your stress on others or protect other people from your own stress and that isn't to say that you have to be the punch bag you doesn't you don't have to be the place where all stress resides uh but you know try not to hold it just try and deflate if you imagine it's a football try and deflate the football like just stab it like get rid of the stress in this situation this is what we need to do this is what i'm going to do this is what you're going to do okay great let's go i love it that's super powerful uh last question uh you said you listened to a few of the other shows you may, may have been expecting this one um, what advice would you give to that younger self where you were kind of scared to scared to leave that job, stuck in that job? I would say have faith in yourself that you can make it work. That if you keep trying, if you're if you keep going at it, it is that constant failure eventually leads to success. So walking away from stuff, letting it go wrong, accepting that it didn't work out is fine as long as you keep going at it because you will find the thing that works eventually. Love it. Funnily enough, uh, the guy, Tom, who uh, produces, uh, edits a podcast, we're actually going to make a video, which is around like loads of different people asking that question and put it all together. And then he asked me to answer it. And I gave quite a similar uh, answer around you know, don't be scared to fail because I was quite self-conscious when I was younger about like failure as now yeah. as you get older, you get a bit more resilient. My colleague, was it more rhino skin? I think more rhino skin. I think the other thing which I get much better at is really differentiating between what I'm really good at and really bad at. And being maybe, I mean, this is a more interesting answer anyway, but if you're really clear about what you're bad at and really clear about what you're good at, it's much easier to make the right decisions for you rather than trying to sort of skate through everything. And I, I find I, maybe I'm quite an unbalanced person and that I think I'm 
pretty good at the things I'm good at, but really, really terrible at the things that I'm bad at. I mean, literally parked my car in a bush this morning at the supermarket because <laughs> I had a panic attack about parking again. Um, so I'm just so, but generally I don't really drive. It's only because my husband's way that I even consider driving. So um, yeah, so I just get better at not doing things that's <laughs> rubbish at. <laughs> <laughs> if you right. ask me now to do a really data heavy job in a basement i'd say no absolutely not yeah. environments are really important to me i'm not really interested in big data sets it wouldn't even occur to me now to do it but i didn't know yeah. myself as well then i love that um we'll put a link to your linkedin a couple of the resources you've mentioned you've got any like yeah. books talks or anything coming up you wanted to you wanted to tell people about I, I do three or four talks a week. Uh, so uh, follow the LinkedIn, follow uh, follow me on LinkedIn, comment on the blog, uh, say hi, give me a wave, uh, come to a talk if you see one in your organisation or trade body or whatever. I'd love to meet Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thanks so much for coming on, Christine. I've, I've learned Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Michael. I'm just going to go for one takeaway from today's show. There's been loads. I've really enjoyed talking to Christine, but I really like the one of the more stress you throw at something, the more stress is going to come back your way. So whether it's your employee, whether it's your boss, whether it's a colleague, if you come at that from a place of like anxiety and stress and all that, they're going to feel the stress and they're going to throw that stress back at you. And that doesn't mean don't have difficult conversations. You need to have open communication with your colleagues, with your boss, whoever it is, but do it in a calm way. Don't do it in an angry, emotional way. Try and bring it up in a calm way and tackle it that way. I really like that advice from Christine. If you like today's show, please subscribe to us on YouTube and on all podcast platforms. And then if there's a friend you think who maybe is a bit stressed in the workplace, you can send it to them. That's always appreciated. And please give us a review on Spotify or Apple or wherever you're listening. And we will see you next week.